I'm in the water cube with uh, Alain, uh, Alain Vidal. Uh, yeah. Could you please uh, sh just show your badge for the people looking now? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Alain, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, so I'm Alain Vidal. I'm the director of the uh, challenge program on water and food of the CGIR. And the CGIR is the uh, uh, consultative group on international agricultural research. So. We are actually a cross-cutting program of a consortium of international agricultural research, mm -hmm. agricultural research institutes uh, working on water and food and working at all the issues that relate uh, food production, be it agriculture, livestock, fisheries, uh, ecosystems relying upon water and, uh, well, related to uh, improving water management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so you know this is the second year we do the water cube. Yeah. Uh, we had you as a guest last year. Uh, I'd be, you know, very interested to, in in your vision on uh, what's happened the last year and uh, in other aspects, if you'd mind. Okay. Uh, well, last year um, I, I was I was here with my new hat. I had just joined this challenge program, and uh, I was in a session that in a session that was dedicated to to water and food issues, mm. and that was quite interesting to see uh, the the window that was given to the water and food sector and at the same time the bridges that were built and I enjoyed it very much. Well this year we were invited to uh, uh, by, by CIWI to co-convene a workshop on resilience uh, uncertainties and tipping points together mm -hmm. with the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center uh, with whom we have a partnership and so I was here this week um, a few days beginning of the week working with the uh, Stockholm uh, Resilience Center yeah. and after uh, the second part of the week attending here the, uh, the World Water Week. Uh, today busy with this uh, workshop and that was quite for me very interesting because uh, we were looking at resilience tipping point so we were looking with other with people from but other could sectors. Could you first just for the people who are not in the sector. Yeah. Resilience tipping point. Okay. Well, the resilience, in, a, in simple words, is the capacity of a system, and usually a social and ecological system, to yeah. adapt and to cope with changes happening, be it short-term changes like an economic crisis, yeah. or a long-term change like climate change. And so, uh, and, and this has become an interesting concept to measure how... Uh, fragile systems are, how locked into difficult or degraded situations systems are, and, and also uh, as a good objective to improve the system, to adapt the systems or, the, or transform the social and ecological mm -hmm. system that could be a farming system, that could be an ecosystem, yeah. that could be a city, uh, into a more resilient state that will be, that will be more able to cope with change. Okay. And so today in this workshop we had several examples given to us by scientists from all around the world, from the developing world and, and, and from the industrialized world, examples of uh, changes, uh, examples of what we call regime shift, which is uh, the system is in a given state during a certain time and because of a crisis coming mm -hmm. or because of repeated stresses the system collapses. Yeah. Uh, what I was interested in this year uh, was to uh, show examples where uh, research for development uh, combined techni technical and institutional innovation uh, enabled to restore degraded system okay. to a better status. Okay, can you just very briefly give, give one example? One example. Uh, well, the, the one example that people liked <laughs> today course. is one I, I was giving uh, that happened in Uganda where yeah. uh, we had a very degraded uh, pastoral area with yeah. no more grass yeah. and the grass was not growing anymore and every attempt to reseed the grass was actually destroyed by the termites who had developed in the area. And the way uh, there was a, a combined innovation, technical institutional, where people convinced farmers to cattle their, to corral their cattle together during two weeks in the same place, mm -hmm. 
actually bringing manure to the soil and the termites preferred to eat manure than the seedlings of the grass so the grass could, could develop and so from a very degraded thing with no more grass and only bushes after a few weeks we regreen completely the area mm -hmm. or I should say the farmers there thanks to this innovation regreen the area which find a new equilibrium which seems to be quite resilient which is it doesn't move anymore it doesn't collapse anymore that sounds uh, yeah yeah that's a <laughs> quite amazing. I don't yeah. have the picture and to no, show no, you. No, no, <laughs> when you think about it, it's quite simple, but you know, you need to think about it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, just a closing seconds because we're running a bit out of time. Um, this is a second year uh, in your new function. Uh, what, what are your expectations and uh, in the, the coming years to head and, and you know, the water sector? Uh, uh, there's a lot happening. There's a lot happening. Uh, we all know there's a water crisis. I think now it's, uh, it's something of use for everyone. Probably uh, one thing I'd like to see in the future is that we move from uh, just from the idea of sharing waters yeah. to the idea of sharing the benefits that people can derive from water. Especially important for us because we, have a, we are a poverty-oriented, poverty alleviation-oriented program. But uh, I think it applies in all cases. If people can better share the benefits of water rather than just trying to share water, because sharing water means if I give you more water, I have less. Mm -hmm. Sharing benefits is about uh, having winners, only winners around the table. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a good perspective for the future in our water sector. Okay, well, let's work to that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alain. You're welcome. Thank you, too.